One of the keys to maintaining healthy, vibrant cultures of isopods is ensuring that their environments are stable. A basic understanding of making sure that the system stays balanced, meaning the chemistry within the soil, the substrates, the stratification, the layers of the soil, that they say stable. So we add certain products to that to aid. Charcoal is not something that you would normally found just, you know, abundant laying around in the woods. You know, sure trees do get burned, sure forest fires happen, but we add charcoal as a sweetener. It absorbs products. It takes products that are maybe harmful to the environment out of the environment and stores them. There's other things that we add to the environments to stabilize them as well. But every once in a while, because, you know, as the populations explode, you can see all the new generations of isopods come in there. As the populations start to explode, the resources and the environment and the stability in the environment start to degrade. And that's sometimes we get to the point where we have to go and reset an isopod bin. Resetting an isopod bin gives you a chance to re redo those elements, reintroduce those elements that are critical to survival, restabilizing the environments. As these cultures mature, you'll notice that the resources start to disappear, and we are left with a lot less organic matter and more frass, frass being the waste product of the isopods. It's an acidic product, and as it builds up, it can eventually sour the culture. So we have to ensure that we're always, when we're doing our maintenance, we're checking to see how stable the environment is. Making sure that we're replacing resources as needed. Make sure that the environment, the pH and the chemistry of the substrate stays relatively stable. These are fairly hardy animals and they can adapt to a lot of changes. They've been here longer than people and they'll probably be here a lot longer after we're gone. But we do have to ensure that they have all those needs being met, especially when we're maintaining them in a culture like tub like stuff like this. So today, I thought we would go and reset a couple of isopod bins. We're not resetting because they've become problematic, but it still gives you the same ideas, the same, uh, same discussion. This one here is my Priscilio Lavis orange culture. And it, you'll notice it's in the wrong bin. It's in our old style bins. Now, do the bin works? Yeah, the culture's thriving, but they're actually a very, very productive species, and they produce a lot of waste product, and the culture can sour very, very quickly, and it's one item that we haven't changed over to the new bins yet. So we're going to reset those orange lavas, and we're going to reset these guys here, which are my yellow, my maculatum, my yellow zebras, and we're going to get those two guys set up, and you'll see kind of the process of how I go through setting up not necessarily a new bin, but transferring over in an existing colony all that natural bacterial and flora and fauna, everything into that new bin, but also recharging that bin. So let's take a peek. As you guys have seen in some of the videos, like the ones pertaining particular to the Maraluna tricolor, as well as the expanses, we've done some experiments. We've set them up in these natural styled vivariums, fully planted, similar to something that they would see in nature. So for me, for setting up whether it's one of those style of vivariums or we're going to be looking at a tub, they all start with the same base. And that is my substrate mix that I've mixed up. It's the same type of mix. I've shown you guys video after video how I make my mix. You know, it's got all those beautiful components, that white rot wood and lots of leaf litter. Some have different types of mosses mixed in. The natural mosses just happens to be long fibered sphagnum moss. It's got the charcoal. It's got all those different components. Nice organic soil mix. I'll put a link up in the corner for how I go about making my soil mix. Or more importantly, how you could make your own soil mix by demystifying and breaking down what the purpose of each of these components are. Once we've got our soil mix in place, then we have to add a few things to make sure that it's ready to go to be healthy and ready for isopods. So we start with our good base. It's already well mixed. I always maintain a large uh, portion of this mixed in the fish room in the layer, so I always have it available. I keep all my components outside in the garage uh, ind independently, and then I bring them in and I mix up my own mix anytime I need. So I always have a good tub ready to go. But basically, we go and set up, we start, we get a nice good base layer of, uh, of our substrate mix, 
In the case that this is not a brand new setup, there is a lot of the material in the existing bins that we will be moving over into these bins as well. The next step, we'll just close this one up. After we've gone and gotten this step already, you can see it's all nice and loamy and mixed. It's got all those components all nice and loose, ready to go. The one thing that we definitely have to add to it is we have to add a calcium source to it. This just happens to be one that I use that I have available. It's a calcium carbonate substrate that is used in the reptile industry because it's a fully edible product for any, a lot of the animals and it acts as a good substrate mix. I like to put this type of product and we're going to have a separate video coming out on calcium shortly. But I like to use this product, one, because once it's mixed in, you get kind of that salt effect. You kind of see it in the substrate, so it's available. That way I always know that it's readily available. And it's one of those visible cues to me that when I'm uh, resetting or looking at resetting bins, I, I always check to see how much of the calcium is really, really visible. Depending on the type of species in question, I often add more or less most of the isopods are fairly good when it comes to something like a Kubaris that is a lot more uh, calcium dependent. Some of the larger Spanish uh, Porcilio species and Greek species, they're often a little bit more uh, calcium dependent. And also the other factors, the, 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 the product here also helps to really stabilize the environment. It stabilizes the environment and the chemistry of the environment by maintaining it slightly uh, uh, just above base. What I mean by that is when you talk about pH, pH in soil is once an animal breathes, once an animal produces a waste product, that product starts to degrade. And those products are all acid. Base is the opposite end of the scale. And you want to try and maintain it naturally right around the neutral mark, which is right in the middle at 7. So calcium and those type of products added to the mix will help stabilize it longer. We got our first one done, that's for one of them, and then we've got our second one done, and the same thing. I just mix it loosely into the soil. Now you could still offer different things. I also offer cuddle bone, which is another calcium source. Uh, you know, it's very, very popular. People use them all the time. It's readily available. It's also readily assimilated by the animals. Some of the harder forms of calcium, like limestone or coral or some of these type of things, so they're not as readily assimilated by the animal versus a cuddle bone. I can just use wipe my finger on it and I'll take calcium off it. Or you can even use things like calcium powders. But a lot of those other ones start to break down very, very quickly in the environment. The other thing is though, there's a lot of good feeding products. As you guys have seen, I'm very, very uh, proud to use uh, Wally Kern's Supreme Isopod Chow. And there's added calcium in the food itself. So I'm always, you know, you can never have too, too much. I'm always making sure that it's always readily available. Now, here we have the existing culture. This one is the yellow zebras. And then here we have the new, uh, new setup that's just got the substrate mix in it. Because we're going to be transferring an existing one over to another one, I don't have to go and start it right from absolute scratch. If I was starting a brand new species that, say, I was importing or had a new species coming, I would have this one set up probably about two to three weeks in advance. I would inoculate it with some springtails, good moisture and stuff, and let the whole environment somewhat kind of mature. But because this one, as I mentioned, we're just transferring everybody over, we're just going to transfer all those products over. Now, I still don't, I don't necessarily need the eggshell, uh, the egg carton anymore. I check it over. There's no isopods on it. We're good to go. I can dispose of those products. A lot of the leaf litter is still fine. I'm just going to transfer a lot of it over. The one thing I, you notice that we do not have set up yet is we do not have a moisture bed yet set up in this. Now, you've seen in a lot of videos that I've, I've been using things like the sphagnum moss, like you see here, but I've also been using a lot of the different types of native mosses. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just transfer over all this product, hopefully not without hurting or dropping anybody. There we go, is our moisture bed. It's all still in very good shape. We're going to tra transfer over our, wax our cork slabs, or our, sorry, not cork slabs, our oak slabs. We still have several different products. That gives you a true example when we talked about the calcium. You can see how much they've really torn into it. You know, it doesn't look anything even like, even this one here, this whole section has all been chewed away. Readily, readily available and easy for them to assimilate. And here's what one looks like when it's completely spent. It looks like a shell. It's thin. There's nothing left to it. 
Well, those ones there, even though they are still, it's still a calcium source, it's a much harder calcium source. They tend to leave it alone compared to the others, if, especially if offered. Uh, but uh, it'll break down a lot slower in the environment, so I often just throw it all back in. Everything always gets reclaimed by nature. So that's basically everything that's going to get moved over. Now what you see on this side is you see a lot of spent product. What I mean by that is this is predominantly frass. There's very, very little natural product that's left in here that is of value to the isopods. But this is absolute gold. This is like earthworm castings. This is like sea soil. This is absolute gold for house plants and stuff. But the only thing, I, as I've shown you guys before, I do not want to be introducing uh, non-native isopods to my environments outside. So I won't go and throw this in the garden just like this. I know this is a, an isopod not from here, so what I will do is I will take that substrate once we've gone through it completely, completely, and then we will go and uh, put it into a bag, and we'll put it into the freezer for a couple of days, make sure that we've killed off everything that's in it possibly, and then we'll go and use it. So now the next step is we're going to actually take this one out of the way. We're going to take this one, we're going to get a little tub, and we're going to go through this bit by bit, finding individual isopods. It is exceptionally tedious but it's the best way to do it. So just bit by bit, just start teasing through the media. You find some leaf litter or things that are components that are still good. The calcium, I just moved the calcium over directly. I'm not gonna go and drop that because I don't want to accidentally drop it on one of them. So I think we did pretty good. It's been a few minutes where we've been searching and haven't found any. I think we've done pretty good. So let's move on to the next. All right, so for the, the maculatum, there's the last of our spoils. We're going to move them over, transfer them over. Just very, very minimal amounts of frass. Nice, clean environment. But by transferring over all that existing product, we also are transferring all that beautiful microfauna, all those other things. I will go and re-inoculate this with springtails, uh, but I also want to go and give it kind of a good wet down because all the original substrate, the new substrate that we just put in there, not the original, but all that new substrate, was put in relatively dry. It's not dry, completely dry, but uh, I want to make sure that we've got a good moisture sink for all these animals, just because this is a little bit of time. If everything's changed for them, we want to make sure they find everything they need. And then we're just going to close up the lid and we're going to leave them be. decidedly took a lot longer because there was an awful lot of them. All the Persilia lavis species like the dairy cows which are paisleys and these oranges, those are also paisleys as well. But Paisley was there to help me do it all so I guess Paisley you can put them all in their new house. Well there we go, we've moved over the two remaining species that needed to be moved because this is a fast replicating species, this will probably give us about a good six month window before we'll have to kind of look at resetting or adding some more components to it again. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. So thank you for watching my friends. Till next time, take care.